Good morning, everyone. My name is Eileen Scalise, and I am the subject matter expert for UTI or and CAUTI. I welcome you this morning here in the room and, and on the web stream. So, so today we're going to define our um, the key the CDC NHSN key concepts and common misconceptions of the NHSN UTI protocol and review how to correctly apply the protocol. We'll identify the correct way to count indwelling urinary catheter days to determine device association to a UTI. We'll identify the data collection form and table of instructions, and then we'll apply what we've learned through case studies. Um, case studies that I've used that are not real studies, however, I tweak them from actual questions people have asked. So the UTI burden, um, it is the fourth most common HAI uh, with over 93,000 UTIs in acute care hospitals. And it accounts for 12% of infections reported by um, acute care hospitals. And approximately 12 to 16% of adult hospital inpatients have a Foley sometime during their stay. And for each day, that a catheter is in place, there is a 3 to 7% increased risk of acquiring a, a catheter-associated UTI. Um, the complications include discomfort to the patient as well as prolonged hospital stay, increased cost, and mortality with over 13,000 estimated deaths per year for UTI. But having said all that, I always like to put... Um, you know, a face to these statistics and a real patient story. Um, so I'm going to minimize and see if I can figure out how to do this. Jerry Allen was a vibrant 72-year-old who was excited about getting her hip replacement behind her and back out on the dance floor with her husband. Jerry had experienced hip pain for years and had seen some pretty nice results in several of her friends who had undergone the same procedure. She was looking forward to being pain-free, or at least having less pain. She had always been so active and had just recently reached the point she could no longer function well. She and her husband were planning a cruise to celebrate her recovery in three months. In no way was she prepared for what happened next. Jerry's surgery was a success. She was recovering well when on the third day after surgery, just as she was preparing to be transferred into the rehabilitation unit, she spiked a fever. Tests ruled out pneumonia and a blood infection, but she did have a urinary tract infection. Her surgeon told her it was from having the bladder catheter in. She had kept the catheter in an extra day because her son had requested it to spare her the extra pain of getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. A few days and a few antibiotic doses later, her infection had cleared up, or so everyone thought. As she was preparing to leave rehabilitation and return home, she began having more pain in her hip area. Her surgeon reassured her that it was most likely due to her increased activity as she progressed. Her incision looked good and there was no drainage. Four days after getting home, that all changed. The incision became very inflamed and started draining a reddish yellow fluid. Her surgeon immediately readmitted her to the hospital and took her to the operating room to open the hip incision. Jerry was diagnosed with a deep surgical site infection. Cultures came back positive for the same organism she had in her urine. Her surgeon said she had probably seeded the hip infection from that urinary tract infection. The next several months were a nightmare. Hospital stays, going back and forth to the operating room to clean out the wound, then finally to remove her new hip. Jerry was sent to a skilled nursing facility to await the point when her wound would be clean enough to have a new hip implanted. She became very depressed and refused to participate in physical therapy. She lost weight and stopped eating. A feeding tube had to be placed. Three months later, when her surgeon decided to go ahead and replace the hip, 
Jerry was not the same person she was at the time of her first surgery. Financial problems were added on top of health problems. Jerry's care was not fully covered by Medicare or her supplemental insurance, and Mr. Allen, her husband, was dipping into their modest savings to pay medical bills, now in excess of $200,000. The end was not in sight either. Who knew urinary tract infections could be so devastating? <laughs> this, this illustrates the, the work that you do for prevention, how critical that is. Um, so I, I thank you and applaud you for, for all your prevention work you do with UTIs and how devastating what we think is a simple infection can really become. And just, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so now we're going to move on to NHSN um, CAUTI definitions. And I just want to refresh what Kathy reviewed with you yesterday about um, Chapter 2. The infection window period, which I may call it IWP or infection window period if you don't mind, um, is the, oh, for UTI, the urine culture always sets this seven-day window. So it's always going to be the urine culture with greater than or equal to 100,000. And uh, then it's three days before and three days after. The date of event is the first element that occurs within that infection window period. The RIT, or repeat infection time frame, um, is set on the date of event. Day one is day one of the 14-day time frame, and so no new infections will, will be reported of the same, no, no new sooties or booties, et cetera, for UTI. And the secondary BSI attribution period is set as well. And that includes the infection window period plus the RIT. And that could be 14 to 17 days in length, depending on the date of event. And, we'll, and I'll be illustrating these later. So let's look at the indwelling urinary catheter. What is an indwelling urinary catheter? And Because I get a lot of questions about, um, you know, is this... Is this a catheter or should I use this urine? Um, so it is a drainage tube that is inserted into the urinary bladder, and this does include a neobladder. And the key here is it's through the urethra. So if it goes through the urethra and it's left in place and it's connected to a collection system, then it should be included in UTI surveillance. Um, this um, catheter is also known as a Foley catheter often. What does not qualify is a straight catheterization or known as in and out catheterization or a condom or Texas catheter. And the following do not qualify unless there's also a Foley in place. So suprapubic catheter, nephrostomy tubes, urostomy, and ileal conduit. Unless there's a Foley in place, those do not count as catheters. So there are two types of urinary tract infections. There's sooty and a booty, which is asymptomatic bacteremic UTI, and sooty is symptomatic UTI. And both types, if they're catheter-associated, must be reported as part of any CMS CAUTI reporting requirements. And uh, the two types of UTIs can be categorized by the age of eligible patients and their association with indwelling urinary catheters. So patients of any age can use um, SUDI-1 and a booty, but only infants less than one year, less than or equal to one year, um, are eligible to use SUDI-2, and we'll see different symptoms uh, in the next slide, I believe, um, each type of UTI, SUDI-1, SUDI-2, and a booty, can be either catheter-associated or non-catheter-associated. It is only the catheter-associated SUDIs and a booties that are reportable to CM um, as part of CMS Quality Reporting Program for CAUTIs. So we'll start with the... Um, criterion, we'll get to SUDI2 criterion, um, but we'll start with SUDI1, which is catheter associated. The patient must meet one, two, and three of the following. The patient had an indwelling urinary catheter that had been in place 
for greater than two days on the date of event, and that device day e placement equals day one, and was either still present for any portion of the calendar day on the date of event, or removed the day before the date of event. And I highlighted any portion of the calendar day because I get questions about, well, it was removed on that day, so it wasn't in place, but it was in place for part of that day, so that still counts. And this following signs or symptoms, um, the patient has at least one, fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius, so not 38 degrees Celsius, greater than, okay? So that's a lot of a question as well. Um, Superpubic tenderness and costovertebral angle pain or tenderness, if they have no other recognized physiological cause for these symptoms. And then urinary urgency, urinary frequency, and dysuria. And keep in mind that these symptoms cannot be in place or used when the catheter is in place. Now, and I'll, later on I'll show you this, but if a catheter is removed and the symptom occurs and then it's reinserted on the same day, you can use that symptom as long as it occurred when the Foley was not in place. Okay, and we'll look at some examples later. Patient has a urine culture with no more than two species of organisms, and at least one of which is a bacterium of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth colony forming units per ml. So let's look at some urine culture clarifications, questions that come in. I'd like to uh, provide clarification. So candida species or yeast or other non-bacterium, such as fungi or mold and parasites, are excluded as organisms in the UTI definition. So keep in mind that blood with these organisms cannot be secondary to UTI. A urine culture with yeast can be included as long as there is at least one bacterium with the appropriate colony count of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth and no more than two organisms. So for example, you could have 10 to the fifth colony forming units of E. coli and 10 to the fifth of candida albicans, and you could use that one. Urine cultures with greater than two organisms are routinely regarded as contaminated cultures and not used for NHSN CAUTI surveillance. So an example would be the E. coli at 10 to the fifth, greater than 10 to the fifth, you have Staph aureus in the urine and also Candida albicans. That's three organisms, so you would not use that culture. That would be considered contaminated. And then also urine cultures, including mixed flora or its equivalent, um, your organization calls it different things, perineal flora, vaginal flora, normal flora. These are different uh, questions I've received. Um, they cannot be used. Um, so even if you have a 10 to the fifth of E. coli, but you have perineal flora, that's a contaminated specimen. Organisms of the same genus, but different species, equals two organisms. So in this example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Pseudomonas stutzeri are, are two organisms. The same organism with different antimicrobial susceptibilities we don't look at, even though we ask for that when you enter it, um, it's the same organism, it's Staph aureus, so that's one organism. One's resistant, one's sensitive, but it's one organism. And, of course, with, with CAUTI, you always set the IWP on the date of the urine specimen collection that meets the, that is eligible, and not the date of specimen result. And do not add multiple urine cultures together. For example, on February 1, a urine was positive for 10 to the 5th of Klebsiella pneumoniae and Citrobacter friendi. friendi. <laughs> I said that wrong. Um, and February 2, urine is positive for Klebsiella oxytoca. This does not meet three organisms. Okay, and again, I guess we can't say this enough, but um, all elements must occur within the seven-day infection window period. And I like to use this. This is when I get questions in my mailbox. This is the 
the flow that I use, and so I thought I would share it with you. I just start with the diagnostic test, the first one that's eligible. I set the, oh, I set the um, IWP three days before, three days after. Then I determine, do I have an element in that window? And then I determine what, what occurred first, the urine culture or the, the other element, the symptom, and determine the date of event. And is it in the POA time period? If it is, then we're done, oh, except it does set an RIT. But um, if not, it's an HAI. So then you would look at, on the date of event, uh, was the catheter in greater than two days? And then, of course, you'd use the transfer rule if, if applicable. The location, we'll talk about location of attribution a little bit later. But let's look at a SUDI 1A example. A patient's admitted to an acute care hospital for a CVA um, stroke. Foley catheter's inserted on day of admission, January 25th. And the Foley remains in place on the 26th, 27th, and on 28th, it's discontinued early morning. And at noon, the patient complains of urinary frequency. On the next day, 129, there's no fever, but urinary frequency continues. The uh, 30th, there are elevated WBCs, and on the 31st, there's a positive urine culture with 10 to the 5th of E. coli. So do we have clickers on the table? Okay, good. The patient's complaint of urinary frequency on 128 after the Foley catheter was removed. Do we have... Um, Oh, yeah, polling's open. Good. Can be used to meet SUDI 1A. And I'm getting some responses in. Good. Is that A, true, or B, false? We're going to get 100% right, right? <laughs> okay, it looks like it's slowing down. I'll close the poll. Oh, 88%. Okay, well, that's good. It is true. The urinary frequency can be used to meet the SUDI 1A criteria because the symptom occurred while the Foley was not in place, and it occurred during the IWP. Does, um, does this patient have an NHSN CAUTI, A for true or B for false? Okay, let's take a look. We'll close the poll. Oop. Okay, so we have 72% who say it is, and they're correct, but we have 28% who say it isn't. Well, let's look at why. Um, so the 131 positive urine culture sets the window, which is, I guess, yellow in this picture. Um, so 128 to 23 the 128 urinary frequency is the first element to occur within the IWP, therefore is the date of event. And the Foley was in place greater than two days on the date of event. So even though it was removed that day, it was in place for part of the day. So when you, want it, when you enter this into NHSN, you're going to choose the risk factor urinary catheter in place even though it was removed that day, it was in place for part of the day, you're going to choose frequency, and you'll get this alert. And this alert just will remind you that, you know, to choose urgency, frequency, or dysuria, you can only choose that if the symptom occurred when the Foley was not in place. Okay, so we'll look at SUDI 1B, non caudi and I know a lot of people don't have this in their reporting plan, but it is really good to hook a secondary bloodstream infection to or um, set a POA, I'm sorry, an, an RIT. So we'll, we'll talk about what SUDI 1B is. Patient must meet one, two, and three below. One of the following is true. The patient has or had an indwelling catheter, but it has not been in place greater than two calendar days or the patient did have a urinary catheter in place on the date of event, but did not, sorry, did not have a urinary catheter in place on the date of event, nor the day before the date of event. 
So all of the symptoms are the same except that fever in a patient that is greater than 65 it cannot use a fever in, in, without a, in a SUDI 1B. So the fever is only allowed in a patient greater, uh, less than or equal to 65. And the reason this is, is in the elderly, non-catheterized patient who has a fever, but no other localizing signs and symptoms, so if you can't find suprapubic tenderness or costovertebral angle pain, um, there is a cause um, other than UTI in 90% of the cases, therefore one of the other UTI signs or symptoms must be present to meet the NHSN UTI criteria in this population to over-avoid calling uh, UTIs. And again, the same symptoms, uh, suprapubic and CVA pain with no other recognized cause, and the other symptoms, uh, frequency, urgency, and dysuria, when catheter is in place, you do not use these symptoms. And the reason is the mere presence of the Foley causes, sometimes causes these symptoms. They feel like they have to go when they have a Foley in. So, okay, and then third, the patient has the same, same urine culture, no more than two species of organisms, at least one of which is a bacterium of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth colony forming units per ml. And again, all the SUDI, all the elements of the SUDI criterion must occur during the infection window period. So let's look at an example. On February 11th, this patient, age 47, was admitted with a fever of 101.7 and a history of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the wound on a previous admission a month earlier. On 213, the urine culture is 50,000 CFUs per ml of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and 100,000 of Candida albicans. No fever. <laughs> On February 15th, the patient spikes a fever of 101.3 Fahrenheit, and urine culture is collected, which results in 100,000 of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and greater than 100,000 of Candida albicans. Okay, clicker time. The first urine culture, with 50,000 CFUs of Pseudomonas and 100,000 of Candida albicans, is used to set the IWP. Okay. Good. Most people said false, and that's good. The urine culture is not eligible because there is not at least one bacterium with greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units. Yeast is an excluded pathogen, so we don't count that 100,000. So this patient meets SUDI 1B, non-catheter associated UTI, A for true and B for false. Okay, let's see what we have. Okay, so 82% of you, we're still having mixed reviews here, but okay, 82% are true, say true, and that is correct. Let's look at why. So we have a urine culture that is eligible on 215. It sets the infection window period here in yellow, 212 to 218, and within that, window, we have a positive, a fever. Um, okay. And so that's the date of event. Both elements occur on the same day, so that's the date of event. And there's no Foley in place. So this meets SUDI 1B non caudi This patient's age 47. Okay. I uh, submitted the rationale for you in your notes, so you have this. I just wanted to also just point out that the 211 fever on admission cannot be used because it does not fall within the IWP of the 215 positive urine culture. And again, the 213 urine culture was not, is not eligible. 
Okay, so here are the little different symptoms for SUDI2, and I want to keep in mind that you can use, um, you only need one, but you, for somebody under one or one year old, you can use SUDI1 criterion two uh, as well. So you can use SUDI1 if they have those symptoms, or you could use these, and the difference is the hypothermia. These, these children, babies, manifest different symptoms. Apnea, bradycardia, lethargy, and vomiting, and you notice the asterisks there are if there's no other recognized cause for those. And the, the urine culture count is the same. Patient has a urine culture with no more than two species, at least one of which is in a bacterium of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth colony forming units per ml. So let's look at an example. On 1223, we have a two month old admitted for diarrhea and a Foley catheter is inserted. On 1227, a few days later, the patient vomits twice. And on 1228, there's a positive urine culture, E. coli greater than 10 to the fifth. So I gave you this answer. The patient does meet a catheter-associated SUDI 2. They're less than one year old. And using the vomiting and the date of event is 1227, which is the first element to occur. Okay, so we're going to move on to asymptomatic bacteremic UTI, also known as a booty. Here the patient also must meet 1, 2, and 3 below. One is the patient is with or without an indwelling urinary catheter, has no signs or symptoms of SUDI 1 or 2 according to age, and again, that's greater than 65 years of age with a non-catheter-associated a booty may have a fever because it doesn't count because it's non-catheter. It's not used as an element, and they could still meet the a booty criterion. And two, the patient has a urine culture with no more than two species of organisms, at least one of which is a bacterium of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth. Additionally, th Number three, the patient has a positive blood culture with at least one matching bacterium to the urine culture, or they meet LCBI 2, criterion 2, without the fever, and we'll talk about that in a minute, with the matching common commensals in the urine. All the elements must occur within the infection window period. The other thing I want to highlight about this is the Urine, the blood culture must match the urine culture that has greater than or equal 10 to the fifth um, bacterium, not, you know, if there's one with 10 to the fifth and one without, it, it, it has to meet the one with 10 to the fifth. Um, so only events with catheters in place greater than two calendar days on the date of event are catheter associated and reportable. Um, if they're in your monthly reporting plan, and this includes catheter-associated abuti. So let's look at an example. On February 20th, a patient's admitted for an MI, fully is inserted. On 221 through the 23rd, there are no UTI signs or symptoms. On 224, there are elevated WBCs, no UTI signs or symptoms a positive blood with staph aureus and a positive urine culture with greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units per ml of staph aureus. And then 225 through 227, no UTI signs or symptoms. On 228, the Foley is removed and the patient's discharged to home. So let's take a look at this. We have a positive urine culture with 10 to the fifth of Staph aureus. So that sets the IWP 221 through 227 here in yellow. So we're, we look in the window for UTI signs or symptoms. We don't see any. However, we find a blood culture that matches the urine organism that has 10 to the fifth of colony forming units. So we can call that in a booty and the date of event, because they both occurred on the 24th of February, is, is the date of event. And then you check, is the Foley in place greater than two days on the date of event? And yes, it was inserted back on February 20th. 
So we went over the UTI repeat infection time frame during the nuts and bolts yesterday, but I do like to reiterate it a little bit. Um, it is a 14-day time frame. Date of event is day one. No new UTIs are reported. For example, you, you wouldn't report a SUDI or an ABUTI if you have a non-catheter-associated um, SUDI. Additional eligible pathogens from urine cultures that occur within the RIT are just added to the event, and you do not change the device association during the RIT. So we'll get to that in a minute. And non-catheter-associated SUDI or ABUTI or catheter-associated SUDI or ABUTI POA sets a UTI, RIT, and a secondary BSI attribution period. We'll, um, catheter-associated is, again, a UTI where an indwelling urinary catheter was in place greater than two days on the date of event. We started to get a theme. Date of event is really critical. That's because it sets a lot of things, decides a lot of uh, the RIT, you know, device association. So we've got to get that date of event right. And device uh, date of, day of device placement being day one, an indwelling urinary catheter was in place on the date of event or the day before. So if an indwelling catheter was in place greater than two calendar days and then removed, the date of event for the UTI criteria must be the day of discontinuation or the next day. Okay, so device association and UTI key concept. Here's a patient admitted with a fever. The next day, they're admitted on January 5th with a fever, and the next day they have a positive urine culture, so they meet POA. He's age 48. Uh, there's no Foley yet. Um, so he meets a non-catheter-associated, present on admission. It sets the RIT in the lighter blue, uh, day, date of event being 1-5, and that's the first day. But you notice the secondary BSI attribution period goes back up um, two days to the top of the infection window period. So the infection window period starts the um, BSI secondary. Later on in the RIT, the patient has another positive urine culture. They also have a fever. So that's the date of event, 110. And now it's day four of the Foley. So it was a SUDI 1B. This changes to a SUDI 1A CAUTI. True or false? False. How come I can't get 100%? <laughs> okay, false. 68% say false. And you are correct. And let's look at why. The 110 date of event occurs within the RIT of the POA event. Therefore, it's considered an extension of the POA event. And it does not become catheter associated during the RIT. That's what we mean by do not change device association during an RIT. There's only one SUDI, whether it's non-catheter or catheter associated, there's only one through the RIT. So we're going to talk a little bit about discontinuation and reinsertion, just so we're clear on this a little bit. If a Foley catheter is discontinued and a full calendar day passes before the Foley is reinserted, then the day count for determining catheter-associated UTI begins again. Otherwise, the day count conti um, continues from the previous catheter. So if you look at example A, um, the patient has Foley day three on March 31st, then on April 2nd, it's removed. On April 3rd, it's replaced. So that count continues. You see, when it's replaced, we call it Foley Day 6. So it's removed on Foley Day 5, but Foley Day 6 is April 3rd, 7, 8, etc. For B, you have a Foley 
on March 31st, Folly Day 3. It's removed on April 2nd on Folly Day 5. There's no um, reinsertion on the 3rd. There's no Folly, but it's replaced on the 4th. Now the Folly count starts again, Folly Day 1. Okay, so let's look at a re reinsertion example. This patient on uh, patient age 59, admitted to the ICU on 3-1 with a Foley insert. They had a Foley inserted on that day. On 3-4, it's removed. 3-5, there's no Foley. They're asymptomatic. On 3-6, the Foley is reinserted, and there's a fever of 100.5. 3-7, there's a fever of 100.5, and a positive urine culture of 100,000 of efficacium, a bacterium, and then later on at 310, they're discharged to home with the Foley. This patient has a caudi, true or false? I think I have the wrong fever, but. Okay. Okay, good. More people said the correct answer, but this is a little difficult, but it's false. Um, let's look at why. Um, so they have a urine culture on 3-7. That's eligible. Sets the infection window period, 3-4 to 3-10. There's a fever on 3-6. That's the date of event. So now we look at the Foley. So the Foley was removed on 3-4. There's a full calendar day without a Foley. And then it was reinserted on 3-6. So this now becomes non-catheter associated, SUDI-1B. And this is the rationale I just Explained. Okay, we're going to move on to data collection form and table of instructions. Again, on our website, under the catheter-associated urinary tract infections, you'll find training links and protocols and our FAQs. I really recommend you look at the frequently asked questions, which will be updated soon, but they're still relevant, the ones that are on there. And uh, we're going to draw our attention to the data collection forms. The form 57114, as we like to call it, is the UTI form. And then the um, table of instructions that accompany that. So here is the UTI form that you, your facility can use, or we have it in a word, and you could tweak it as long as you use the uh, requirements. You know, there are... Um, not optional fields that you have to use. So anyway, um, for each of these fields, the table of instructions instructs you how to fill these out. I get a lot of questions about risk factors, so I'm going to um, talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to bring you to page three because I also there are there needs clarification. I think for um, this form on page three, people ask. Well, what you know? What do I do if they didn't run a susceptibility, or what are the what's the key for the antibiotics? And it's all right here. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. And yes, if it's not tested, you use N. Okay, and so we're going to talk about the risk factors in place or removed, or neither. I think the more questions I get are location and date. One more location, so I'll tell you about that. So here is the table of instructions that goes with that. So in place is if the urinary catheter had been placed greater than two days and was present for any portion of the calendar day on the date of event, which we talked about, removed if a urinary catheter had been in place uh, greater than two days and was removed the day before the date of event, neither is... A uh, patient has had an indwelling catheter or didn't, but has not been in place greater than two days on the date of event 
or never had a urinary catheter in place. And I just also want to draw your attention to the notes, date of device, date of insertion is day one, and, oh, sorry, um, urinary system infection cannot be catheter-associated. Therefore, UCI, as we call it, will only um, present a specific event type if urinary catheter status is marked neither. And if you have a UCI and you have a UTI, um, you report only the UTI. Okay, um, location of device insertion. This is an optional field, and um, so is date of device insertion. The other ones are required. So I'm going to just take you to this instruction page, and I tell, um, tell users to use the custom fields and comment fields if they want to track if a Foley was inserted in an outside facility. Um, and this is the direction on page four of the instructions how to do that. However, there's also a way when we enter, uh, I'll get to that in on this page. Here are the requirements. You see the asterisk, so it's in place, remove, or neither. But this optional field, you can set up your reporting plan to include location outside facilities so that you I'm sorry, not your reporting plan. You, you can include your locations. Um, this, this, there's a drop down to choose this, and then you could have this available to you, um, and then you could put in comment fields where they came from. So just so you know, that's there. And then date of device insertion also is optional, So because a lot of people don't know what, when it was inserted. Um, so that's why they ask that they don't have to fill that out unless you're doing some internal tracking. Okay, and um, the summary data, denominator data, the manual collection, there's a form, and um, you need to fill it out, uh, the count for all locations that, are, that you're tracking in your reporting plan. At the same time each day, you look at the number of patients on the unit, and the number of patients with an indwelling catheter. And this form is available to you, and in this example, on this medical unit, the pa there were 13 patients on the, this date, and eight had urinary catheters. There's an um, alternative to reduce staff time spent collecting surveillance data once weekly. We could do sampling of denominated data to generate estimated urinary catheter days. It may be used as an alternative to the daily collection um, in non-oncology ICUs and wards. To ensure the accuracy of estimated denominator data obtained by sampling, only the ICU and ward location types with an average of 75 or more urinary catheter days per month are eligible to use this method. And a review of each of these locations um, tells us that the Saturdays are not a good day to sample, Saturdays and Sundays, that during the week it's better to sample. And then um, you would, um, let me just go to the next slide here. So what you would do is you would uh, put the number of patients in the location, the patient days, um, the number of indwelling catheters, and um, and again, at the same time each uh, at the same time during the month, and the following must be collected: the monthly total patient days based on collection daily, and the sample total patient days, and the sample total urinary catheter days. Okay. Common misconceptions. UTI is a secondary infection. Positive culture on admission automatically equals POA. Not, not accurate. UTI signs or symptoms such as fever on admission automatically equal POA. That's not accurate. And the RIT continues during a readmission. So let's look at each of these. UTI is a secondary infection. 
It's a primary site of infection and cannot be considered secondary to another site of infection. So when a patient meets a caudi and the same organism is identified in a burn wound culture, um, uh, burn, um, these are considered two sites of infection. So they're not, uh, the caudi is not secondary to a burn. When a patient meets a new event, a caudi cannot be classified as a secondary infection, even though the same organism is identified. So the patient actually can have two sites of infection. Positive on, a positive culture on admission automatically means POA. So in this example, we have a patient admitted on 1-1, and on 1 2, which is in the POA time period, they have a positive urine culture, E. coli. And it's in the POA time period. But when you set the infection window period, there are no UTI signs or symptoms and no positive blood. So there's no event. Later on in the stay, there's a positive urine culture, sets the infection window period, and there's a fever. So now we have an event on 1-9, and the Foley was in place greater than two days because it was inserted on admission. Therefore, it's caudi. The positive urine culture during the POA time frame without UTI signs or symptoms nor matching blood organism in the IWP of that urine culture is not an event, therefore it does not meet POA. And, you know, people like to say, well, the caudi relates back to the positive urine culture, and it, that's not a consideration. You only use what's in the IWP. Okay, number three, UTI signs and symptoms. This is similar to the urine um, in that when they get admitted, you just automatically say it's POA. They must be accompanied by a urine culture, and they must occur within the infection window period of that urine culture, and the date of event must occur within the POA time period. So we'll look at an example here. So we have a patient admitted with a fever on 3-1, and a Foley catheter was in place. But the UTI criteria is not met, POA, because there's not a positive urine culture. Later on in the stay on 311, there's a positive urine culture which sets its IWP. Fever on 310, so that's the date of event. And it's now a caudi. Well, it's a caudi because they came in with a fever, uh, foley and it stayed in. The foley's been in greater than two days. Um, you cannot use the 3-1 fever, even though it's greater than 38 degrees Celsius, because it does not occur within the IWP. Um, the fourth misconception is the RIT continues during readmission. And actually, it applies during a, pa single pa a patient's single admission, including the day of discharge and the day after, in keeping with the transfer rule. So we'll talk about that. First, I want to say the location of attribution is where the patient was assigned on the date of the UTI event. That's the date of the first element to meet the UTI criterion. So that's the location of attribution. But there's an exception to the location, and that's the transfer rule. If the date of event for the UTI is on the day of transfer, tra transfer or discharge or the next day, the UTI is attributed to the transferring or discharging location or facility. And it is advised that receiving facilities should share this information about such HAIs so that they can enable reporting at that transferring facility. Or if it's your own, <laughs> you'll, you'll be aware. So let's look at how the transfer rule and the RIT work. So on, a, on November 23rd, a patient is discharged from an inpatient care facility with an indwelling catheter. And on the 24th, they're readmitted to the same inpatient care facility. 
with a positive urine culture, Klebsiella pneumoniae, greater than 100,000, and the Foley remains intact. On the 25th, they have a fever of 38.7, and then on the 26th, a second positive urine culture for Klebsiella, again, the same colony count. First question for you is, does the RIT continue with readmission? And I want 100% on this. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, don't have 100%. Are people sleeping? <laughs> okay, it's false. You do not, an RIT does not continue with a readmission. But does this meet the transfer rule? That's another question for you. A is true and B is false. Okay, I think we'll see what we have here. Oh, not 100%, but getting there. Yes, it does. 85% say yes. Let's look at why. So the patient's discharged on 11-23. They're readmitted on 11-24 with a positive urine culture. They have a fever uh, within the infection window period that was set by that positive urine culture. So we have a POA event for the readmission. That sets an RIT, as you see here in blue, and a secondary BSI, as you see here in lighter blue. The CAUTI date of event is the day after transfer. Therefore, it's attributed to the previous admission. So it did not, the RIT did not cross admissions, but using the transfer rule, and having it POA, it sets another RIT. And then the second urine culture falls within the RIT of the SUDI. And so that's just added, well, it's the same pathogen. Okay, we'll do case studies. Um, when you submit questions for case review, this is kind of a list of the um, el elements that would be required so that I could um, help. So the date of admission, you could read through this. Um, it's important. I don't like to know their birthdays. Um, that's personal identifiable information I call PII. Don't send me any of that. Just tell me if they're over 65 or under 65. Or 65, that's fine too. Um, yeah, and then um, people forget to put the colony count, so I really need the colony count and um, all of this information. So, And also, if you would include what you think it is, because that will help me to understand your understanding, and then I could focus on um, that education piece. Okay, so let's look at case one. Um, patient on 3-2 is 57 years old, admitted with a fold, and gets a Foley inserted. On 3-3, fever of 100.9, and 3-4, a fever of 100.2. The urine culture on 3-5 is, is eligible. It has coag negative staph 100,000. Okay, get your clickers. The day two fever can be used as an element in this age patient. True is A, and B is false. a nice fast response. Good. <laughs> okay, 87% have the correct answer. It is true. Um, anybody who answered false to that, maybe you could talk to me later. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so let's look at the rationale. The urine culture on 3.5 sets the infection window period in, I guess it's a light blue now, or gray, um, 3.2 to 3.8. The first element to occur is the fever on fully day two, but this patient is less than 65. So that's used, and so that's the date of event. The Foley catheter was only inserted for one day on the date of events, so day two is not greater than day two. So it is um, non-catheter-associated UTI, right? Um, and it is POA, but it also sets a secondary BSI attribution period and an RIT. So it meets the SUDI 1B non-catheter. But let's look at the same case, and the patient's 67. So it's the same thing. Foley's inserted on the day of admission. There's a temperature on, of 100.9 on 3.3. On 3.4, it's 100.2. On 3.5, there's an eligible urine culture with coag negative staph. Okay. The day two fever can be used as an element in this patient. True or false? People are a little more hesitant, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So false is the correct answer. Um, let's look at why. Well, actually, before we do that, if you would poll what is the correct determination in this case? Did they meet A, a SUDI 1B non caudi Does this patient meet B, SUDI 1A caudi C, the patient has a non-catheter-associated abuti, or D, this patient does not meet a UTI event. Okay, we'll shut, close the poll. All right, well, good. Most of you got the correct answer. They do not meet an event. Okay, so let's look at why. So we have a urine culture that sets, again, we start with the urine culture, sets the infection window period, um, 3.2 to 3.8. Cannot use that fever on day two of the Foley because the patient is greater than 65. So we look at the next fever and we can't use it because it's not eligible. It's not greater than 38 degrees Celsius. There are no other UTI elements nor matching blood organism within the IWP. Therefore, this does not meet a UTI event. No RIT is set. Okay, we just have three, two more cases, I think. Okay, so the patient is admitted on January 6th with a Foley inserted. Oh, I'm sorry, admitted Foley was inserted. Temperature of 100.3 degrees Fahrenheit. 1.7, temperature of 100.7 degrees Fahrenheit. 1.8, temperature of 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit. On 1.9, the Foley is discontinued with a t temperature max of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 110, 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And on 111, the urine culture is positive for greater than 100,000 of Proteus mirabilis and 50,000 of E. coli, temperature max of 99.6. 112, temperature max 99.6, and then 113, discharge to rehab. So this patient does not meet CAUTI criteria. It's kind of a backwards question, but... Is it A, true, or B, false?
Okay, we'll close the poll. Thank you for your responses. Okay, I guess we needed this training, huh? Um, okay, so we have 59% with the correct answer, 41% um, on a learning curve. Okay, let's look at the rationale here. So the 111 urine culture sets the infection window period, um, depicted here in yellow. It's yellow. The first element to occur within the window is the fever, 100.8. That's the date of event. And the Foley was in place greater than two days because it was inserted on 1-6. So it meets SUDI 1A, CAUTI, date of event 1-8. So, e and this is, this is tricky. I get a lot of questions about this. Even though the positive urine culture occurred two days after the Foley catheter was removed, the 1-8 fever was the first element to occur in the seven-day infection window period. Therefore, it's the date of event. Again, that date of event is critical to get that correct. On the date of event, the Foley catheter was in place greater than two days, and that's why it meets CAUTI. And the only pathogen here is the Proteus mirabilis. You wouldn't report the E. coli because it doesn't have the correct colony count. All right, case four. Patients admitted with a chronic Foley, so long-term Foley, they have a fever of 40.1 degrees Celsius and a positive urine culture that's eligible, Klebsiella pneumoniae. On 3-2, they have a fever of 41.1 Celsius, and then all the way later, 3-14, they have a, 30, a fever on 3-14, 39.9 Celsius, and then on 315, a positive urine culture with um, an eligible pathogen greater than 100,000 enterococcus. So let's look at this one. So basically, we have a POA um, because we, the patient came in with a chronic Foley. It doesn't matter what age they are because you can use the fever because the, the Foley has been in greater than two days for that patient. Um, there's a positive urine culture on the date of event, sets the uh, window period. And I think, I want to say this is not a leap year, 228, 220. We go back just two days instead of three when the positive urine culture is on day of admission. That's like your POA time period. That's as far back as you can go for an admission. So it's two days um, you know, back and then three days after the urine culture. Um, okay, so we have a POA event, sets an RIT in the light blue, and then the secondary BSI attribution period in the dark. But later on here, we have a positive urine culture, but oops, it falls out of the RIT. However, there's a fever in the RIT. So that's the date of event, and you can say that positive urine culture is part of that POA event. Now, if you didn't have a fever and you just had the urine culture, um, you would set a window and then see if there are any symptoms after the window. I mean, on you know, the three days after the urine culture. That might be a new event. Okay. So this is the rationale. Again, it's not a leap year, so... <laughs> Um, I wanted to illustrate the two days before when the date of the urine culture is on the day of admission. And when you use the HEI generator, it, it figures that out for you as well. Um, so if your urine culture is on the day of admission, it gives you the two days before the admission date. Um, and you can use symptoms. Kathy mentioned this yesterday. You can use symptoms if they're documented in the current medical record. You can use UTI symptoms if eligible. Um, in Chapter 2, we describe some examples there. Um, the, as we said, the 315 sets an IWP, 312 to 318, which overlaps the other um, RIT. And so that fever fell within the, um, the RIT. So you can, it's not a new UTI event. Last case, 
This poor patient has been in the hospital a long time for colon mass, and several weeks into the stay, um, they had a Foley placed on 130, and oh, two weeks later, they still have it in. Um, they do have a positive wound culture with Staphylococcus species and Enterococcus faecalis on 211. On 214, they have Staphylococcus epidermidis um, greater than 10 to the fifth, and blood culture staph epidermidis in two of two culture bottles drawn on separate occasions. On 215, they have hypotension. Then on 211 through 17, there's no fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius and no UTI signs or symptoms. So, hopefully you can read that. What is the correct determination in this case? A, the patient meets SUDI1A CAUTI. B, the patient meets catheter-associated ABUTI. C, the patient does not meet a UTI event. Or D, this patient meets primary LCBI2 BSI. Oh, okay, we'll close the poll. Okay, so most people got the correct answer, yay. Um, this meets catheter-associated booty. Um, it's interesting that 25% thought it was a primary BSI. You don't want to give yourself a primary BSI if you don't need to. <laughs> okay, let's look at why. So in order to meet a booty criterion using a matching blood common commensals, the patient must meet LCBI2 with either chills or hypertension, not fever. Does anybody know why? Because if they had a fever, it would be a SUDI then, right? And then the blood may be considered secondary, but it would be a SUDI. Okay, so let's look, let's look at this case. So we have a positive urine culture setting the IWP, and there are no UTI signs or symptoms within the IWP. However, there's a positive matching common commensals from two separate draws, draws <laughs> and there's hypotension. So they're meeting LCBI2. So now it can, and the date of event is the date of the urine culture. And so this meets, well, it meets catheter-associated because the Foley was in place on admission. And it's a booty with the matching common commensals as secondary and reportable if it's, if it's uh, in your reporting plan because it's catheter-associated. So in summary, we reviewed the key concepts and common misconceptions of the NHSN UTI protocol. We looked at eye indwelling urinary catheters in place, inserted through the urethra, inserted through the urethra, and left in place. Do not change device association during the UTI RIT. RIT does not cross over um, admissions in keeping with the transfer rule. Positive urine culture or UTI signs or symptoms on admission does not automatically meet POA, and the same holds true for, um, oh, signs or symptoms, I said that. Okay, and then UTI is a primary site of inf infection and is not considered secondary. Um, again, a calendar, a catheter, urinary catheter days determine device association, so you want to get those counts correct when there's a removal and a replacement. We looked at the data collection form and table of instructions. And uh, yes, the form has been updated for the 2017 UTI definitions. There weren't changes to the definition, just clarifications. Um, we made uh, correct determinations. Well, I wish it was all correct, but maybe there'll be some questions about why you're struggling with this. Um, 
We looked at the transfer rule, the IWP, the UTI RIT, and those three symptoms, dysuria, urgency, and frequency that can't be used in the presence of an indwelling urinary catheter. We reviewed fever, age, and device association, and we made determinations um, based on cases. So, great job. I just want to direct you for more information and available training. Again, I showed you the training on the website, and I think Henrietta will be reviewing that this afternoon, um, which is uh, not required to go to, but at lunchtime. And then, as Kathy stated, again, to really, you know, even today it tells you that not everybody is answering the question the same way, so it's, this is a really good tool to work with your staff to get interrated reliability and see how everybody answers these case studies. So, now we're at questions. Any questions from online? Yes, we do have um, a few questions from the web stream audience. Uh, the first one is, how should Foley's inserted in the OR or the ED be entered? Okay, how should they be entered? Um, so so f f the, the vice day count for the denominator occurs, starts with the day they're admission, admitted to the inpatient location. Um, so if they have a Foley inserted in the OR and they, on 2-1 uh, and then they don't get admitted to 2-2, two, two, the device day count begins there. Same for the ED. I think that is the question. Oh, yes, and I, talk, I talked about the insertion field that you can, uh, the Foley insertion field is optional and you can use other location if you put that in your locations, or well, actually outside the facility, which ED is, because it's an outpatient, and then you could just put that in the comments section. Anything else? Okay, there's one there. Um, I'm Lisa from Toledo, Ohio. Hi, can Lisa. Can we use a urine culture before the date of admission? If it, a couple things, yes, if it occurs, well, first of all, if it's eligible, meets the criterion, if it occurs within the first two days of admission and, um, wait, just blinking out, um, and it's documented in the medical record. It has to be documented in the current medical record. So if they come over from a nursing home or a doctor's office with that urine culture done from the day before right to our ed or whatever and are admitted and then they have the temperature etc we can use that urine we don't have to get another urine ourselves that that's correct you can use that urine um keep in mind if if they're coming you know their age and fever and device association so when it's fever you're going to have to think about those things so you might want to encourage you know some assessment documenting super bb tenderness or flank pain not just fever because that's more localizing so it would really identify a poa for you okay thank you next thank you Hi, uh, this is actually just to clarify. Um, while ED, time spent in the ED or the OR doesn't count for device days, it still counts as um, catheter day. Correct. Correct, that's a really good question. So yes, you don't count d denominator days, device days until they get admitted. However, if they've had the Foley in for two days in the ED, then that is a device day. So you could actually have a CAUDI POA, you know, even though they weren't in your place greater than two days, that Foley was in greater than two days. I hope that didn't confuse you more, but okay. Another question from the web stream. Go ahead. So this question is, why does UTI criteria use a cutoff of 65 years of age, and how is this concluded? Yes, yeah, so um, as I stated, um, in 90% uh, of the elderly with uh, fever alone and no other localizing symptom, the, um, uh, there are 
90% of the causes are for um, something else in this population. And so um, we don't want to overcall UTIs. And um, what was the second part? Oh, and the, and the justification, um, w there was research done, and uh, we have the paper, um, I don't have the paper, but there was research done in this population. And also, if you look at McGeer definitions as well, when there's not a non-catheter-associated, um, uh, if there's a non-foley in the patient, they have to have localizing symptoms. So it's this population. Got another question here? Hi, could I clarify Lisa's question? Um, so where is Lisa? Lisa asked if we can count a, a urinary um, culture that's taken before admission. And Within the I first thought, two days of admission in that POA time period. Oh, and then the date of event becomes, to set an RIT, et cetera, becomes the day of admission, even though the urine was the day before. You know, I'll put that in my examples. That's a good question. So we can count it if it occurs when? Within the two days of admission in that POA time period. If you go to Chapter okay. 2, it and Kathy showed it yesterday, that POA time period mm -hmm. is two days before admission, right. okay. day of admission, it. but it has to be documented in the current medical record. Okay. Think Thank of you. validation. They, they ha that makes you know. sense now. Thank okay. you. Okay, good. You know, that's a, that's a good question, and I think I'll add that kind of example in my training. Anything else? Oh, you get five minutes extra for... Oh, wait, one more question, sorry. Go ahead. We have one more from the web stream. Um, this question is, the patient is admitted from the nursing home with a chronic Foley, and the Foley was not changed by, the, by us, by the new admitting facility. Um, three days later, the patient has a fever and a positive urine culture. Does it count as a CAUTI for the facility? You know, that's a case question, and um, I, I um, so, okay, so perhaps I can answer this. So there's a, f a f fever and a positive urine culture three days later, and the fever is three days later. So, yeah, that's in the HAI time period. So, yeah, that's... That's a caudi attributed to your hospital. Right? I mean, everybody here knows, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes. Okay, I guess that's it. So thank you very much. Have a good morning, rest of your morning. Thank you.